To my right, Sylvia Bug, Vice President of Diversity and TV Content at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. In this role, she provides strategic leadership to public media to ensure CPB's goals and objectives are met through support of mission-focused pipeline of broadcast and broadband content for national distribution across multiple platforms. She's also responsible for ensuring CPB's priorities are ad advancing diversity across public media, are fulfilled through the collaboration and support of content creators, distributors, and partnering organizations. Prior to CPB, Sylvia was Director of Programming at PBS, where she led efforts to develop a portfolio of drama, performance, and cultural programs. She also held several programming roles in history and public affairs at PBS from 1993 to 1999. Uh, Sylvia spent 12 years in programming, operations, and production for several Discovery Communication Networks, including Discovery Channel and the former Discovery Health Channel. She is a board member for the Council on International Non-Theatrical Events and a past board member and committee chairperson of the Washington, D.C., Baltimore chapter of Women in Cable Telecommunications. Sylvia. So, yeah. <laughs> now, Marie, fashion icon. Um, is a content developer with experience in public media, broadcast network, and cable organizations at PBS. She serves as Vice President of News, Public Affairs, and Documentary, and oversees the production and programming of national primetime series and specials, and works to develop and direct innovative approaches to engage audiences, which we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, prior to joining PBS, she served as executive producer of national programs at PBS member station WGBH in Boston. Before her tenure at GBH, uh, she was vice president of news and original programming for Viacom and BET networks, where she oversaw a range of cross-platform projects. She also served as the founding executive producer for NPR's Tell Me More, and, is, and as a producer for, producer for Nightline, which... I watched my whole life growing up with Ted Koppel, and I remember like begging my parents to stay up late to watch it. Can, that's how nerdy I was. How about that? Um, with Ted Koppel and World News Tonight at ABC News, Nelson has also served in foreign policy and public affairs appointments in the Clinton and Obama administrations. Okay, so I want to start off with a couple of general questions because I think... I know, let me just put it this way. I know for a fact that for a lot of filmmakers, and I'm, I wanna try to help filmmakers understand that um, you know, CPB and PBS and public media in general can seem very confusing. It's, they're big, they're, they're in Washington DC, they're these big organizations. I don't understand how they work. I'm just trying to scrap with POV and ITVS and get in there and get my show there. And so, you know, understanding this whole infrastructure that sits underneath it and supports it, I think, is, is challenging for, for some people. Um, so can you, the two of you, just talk a little bit about um, CBB, PBS, you know, how you function, how you work together, and particularly when it comes to diversity, innovation, inclusion. And, I'm, I'm gonna start with you. Sure, no, that's great, and it's a great question. Um, so the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and for those of you who may not know where we're located, we're just two blocks over on 9th Street. So we are based here in Washington, D.C., and we are the stewards of federal funds that come from uh, the government to help fund public television and public radio. So really about 70% of the funding we receive actually goes back to the station. So your local public television stations, those funds actually help support the efforts there. And then you've got the remainder amount that goes towards supporting content services um, on the television side, but also on the radio side and digital side. So I think the most important point to remember, um, the distinction is that we are not a producer, we don't produce programs. Um, we also don't distribute programs. Um, we have relationships with the folks at PBS, World Channel, ITVS, POV, so we have public media partners, but we're not um, a distributor of, of content, but we do provide funds, uh, grants, to filmmakers and content creators. I guess um, picking up from that, on the PBS side, it's 
it's fantastic to me that there really is a little bit of confusion about how to how to penetrate because to me it speaks to the fact that there are so many points of entry for producers and so some of it is really just figuring out a little bit how to best target or best navigate that system. I mean, certainly one of the things I always explain to folks who aren't as familiar with public broadcasting is that it's not like a traditional commercial network. Um, it's made up of you know 350 or so individually owned and operated mem member stations. Each of those stations have the capacity to develop their own um, programming strategies for their stations or to work in partnership with folks to help them program their schedules. And of course, one of the reasons why they, they pay that um, you know, sizable subscription to PBS is for us to work in partnership with them in doing that. And so at PBS, what we pr primarily do is we work on developing the national primetime schedule when it comes to general audience programming. And then, of course, there's an entire other um, universe of programming for PBS kids. Within PBS, I'm in the general audience programming team, and essentially there are uh, three kind of thematic buckets for that team. So my team oversees all of the news, journalism-focused, uh, independent film series and specials. Uh, then there's another team that's headed up by Bill Gardner, who oversees all of the history, natural history, science, all of that programming. And then Roberto Rodriguez is the person on our team who oversees all of the arts and culture content. Uh, and so that just gives you a little bit of a sense of how general audience programming is organized. One of the things that's also, I think, helpful is to understand that within the member station universe, there are a handful of larger producing stations that also um, do quite a bit of work in terms of producing content for the system and uh, serving as presenting stations for, um, for um, collaborations that they have with, with outside producers. So those would be your WGBH in Boston, WNET in New York, WIDA, KQED, and there are a few others. So yes, there are a lot of different ways to approach us, but I think within this community, one of the things that we find it important to remind folks is that even in addition to all of the things that we are doing in the independent film and documentary space, there are many, many, many other content areas where there is a desire to reach out and to find new talent and to work with filmmakers and producers. And I would just add on the station um, level, there's an important piece in addition to the content. It's, it's the engagement. So um, one of the main initiatives that we have at CPB is American Graduate. And so American Graduate has been designed to really provide resources and a hook for local stations to really engage in their communities around issues uh, related to education and student achievement. So virtually, most of the projects I would say that we support have some engagement concept because we, we think it's important to have that voice be in the community to help to add to the dialogue of, of any particular issue um, of, of what's happening. It could be around veterans or education or other um, programs that we are supporting on the production side. We think it's important to have that community and station engagement. And I think Michonne might still be here. so. Hey, Michonne. So Michonne's, Michonne is great and knows a lot about um, the engagement efforts um, that we undertake and, and the work that she does with uh, the, our friends at ITVS. So um, I would just, if I can give a quick shout out to the CPB team. So Catherine Washington is here. And if you guys haven't met Catherine, um, she works on the TV content team, but she is really the force at CPB behind the Next Generation Leadership Program, which if you guys sat with Carlos Sandoval yesterday, you heard a lot about, but she really is is the, the wisdom and the brain behind Next Generation leadership. Maisha, Maisha Johnson is also here, and Maisha works on our team and is deeply involved with the work that the National Minority Consortia do, um, and Maisha has such a keen sense of activities and um, works a lot with our friends over at WTA on some of our performance programming. So if you don't know her, I would suggest that you spend a few minutes with her because she has a deep knowledge and wisdom at CPB. Linda Clark, is also here, and Linda also works um, very closely with our minority consortia, and uh, Linda's role at CPB is really more of the big vision operations um, and, and how we're flowing details and information throughout uh, the system at CPB, and she works a lot with the minority consortia and other major 
producing station. So we've got a good little contingent of CPB people here today. So if you get a chance to say hi to those folks, um, that would be great. So on the radio side, Erica Pulley Hayes is VP of radio. She's not here today, um, but she's someone great to know. Joyce McDonald is our VP for uh, journalism. Um, Joyce is former NPR and has a deep knowledge of that space. Um, and Stephanie Aronson oversees engagement. And Michael Fergell oversees um, our, our children's uh, content. And um, so we've got a full slate of folks at CPB. So I would encourage you guys to get to know as many of us as you can. Fantastic. I don't want to forget Marianne, who's in the back. Oh, Marianne. Too. How could I forget? See, she went to the back. Marianne Salmon, really, if you look around and CPB support, she's really been the, the brain person and trust of all of this. And Marianne is what I call the, the money person. So I'm good friends with, with Marianne. And we, <laughs> We're all we, we sit Marianne. next to each other. So, you know, she'll give me a reality check often and say, okay, we can fund this. We can't fund that. So please uh, get to know Marianne Salmon, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you for that overview. I think it's, it's really important for people to hear. And, and even things I'm learning, as much as I think I know about how CPB works, I'm still learning. Um, I, I want to ask a question um, before, I, and I think we're going to have an opportunity to talk about some, uh, you know, you've mentioned a few things, next generation leadership, and I think there's some other um, uh, programs that have been supported that we're going to show some content and talk a little bit about it. But I want to ask a couple of things for the group here specific to independent filmmakers. And that's, um, you know, you mentioned before, there's so many ways in. Um, what do you, you know, is that the biggest challenge for people, for producers who haven't worked with PBS before, that there are so many ways in? Or, you know, what do you think the biggest challenge might be for for um, a producer who hasn't worked with you before, and, and um, what do they need to know about a pr before they approach you to make to make an interaction with you most useful for them and for you? I think part of it is quite honestly creating more of a, a more opportunities for us to get to know one another, um, because I think that there is incredible talent. Um, and sometimes uh, what ends up happening is that there's just really a default. So, you know, folks have already had uh, producing relationships and experience working with firms. And so there's a need for something. They reach into their back pocket and say, oh, I know this firm. They, you know, this production company, they can absolutely get the job done. And then before you know it, look at split. Um, they're off to the races. Uh, and so the only way that you really disrupt that pattern is to expand the network. Um, and so I think in some ways that's part of why it's so important for us to continue to have these conversations so that we do become more familiar with the field and they also become more familiar with, um, with exactly what it is that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and so along those lines, we're excited to join this conversation. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly and a lot of times we talk to who may be emerging content creators, and I'll say, you know, who, who have you reached out to who's already in public media? Because we encourage it and reward, I think, if you can find those opportunities to partner with um, organizations who may be interested in some of the, the work that you're doing, sometimes it creates a little bit of an easier pathway. So I would say, you know, get to know folks who, who are doing work in this business and opportunities like this where you've got you know, a good, good group of public media folks who are here from PBS to CPB um, to Michonne who does a lot of work on the local engagement front, Eliza, POV. So talk to these folks and I would always say you know, talk early and talk often. So I'm a huge fan of, even if you've got just sort of a one page or just a concept or an idea, it's never too early to kind of come talk to us about some ideas that you're thinking about. I think it just helps to have a little bit of a, a temperature check around some things that you're thinking about. Because we may know somebody who's got another project that's already in the pipeline, and you may have something that you're cooking up in your brain that may actually be a compliment. So I think in some ways, we can help to bridge that divide a little bit, but we have to know what folks are working on in order to do that. So yeah, let me get let me ask that question because that's something that I'm I'm curious about, and I know that there, are, um, you know, for instance, uh, Michael Collins is here in the audience who made Almost Sunrise, a film, you know, about um, uh, two incredible veterans based out of Wisconsin. Can you talk a little bit about a filmmaker who might be an independent filmmaker that's working on a piece of content that 
you know, aligns with maybe one of the initiatives that are happening. So you mentioned American Graduate. I know that there's veterans coming home. I know that there are other initiatives and things in, in the system that are that are occurring. Is it, you know, is it helpful? Is it, you know, how, how would a filmmaker who is working on something, I know American Promise was a film that was in development for a long time that eventually, um, you know, was able to make a meaningful connection with through POV with the American Graduate Program. How does a filmmaker approach you all about those kinds of system initiatives? And what's the best way to try to, to work collaboratively, um, you know, to, to partner um, in those kinds of instances? Or are there other initiatives that are in play that filmmakers might want to think about that are coming down the pike or that you know of where, hey, there's, that's a, pro a project I'm interested in and I might want to think about collaborating with the system on that? Well, I think that um, this is a little bit of a tricky question because on the initiatives front, sometimes there are clear opportunities for those films and that content to exist within the current, the, within the existing series. Mm -hmm. So for example, we have an upcoming initiative, uh, Spotlight Education, which is gonna be uh, kicking off in uh, September 12th this year uh, with a, a week of, of programs. And a number of those programs, some are going to be um, uh, episodes of ANOVA, we've got episodes of Frontline, uh, we've got some things that are coming that are part of POV. And so in that sense, if it makes sense that the content could work for one of the series, then that's clearly a conversation that, um, that we would be very well positioned to work with filmmakers to try to broker that uh, and make those introductions. Um, where it gets a little bit, uh, a little, the, where it's a little different is if, let's say there's a project, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not something that would sit within a series. So this would really need to be a special um, uh, program on the schedule. Then those are more direct to PBS conversations. And again, it would just depend on the focus of the content as to where and how you would initiate those conversations. Yeah. And, and I think a good example for CPB is something that we, uh, support it that launched recently that we worked with the PBS.org team on and that was veterans coming home so we took a little bit of a different approach to a model about telling veteran stories coming out of a phase one that was with, with Wisconsin Public Television so this time around we focused on a model um, that was digital shorts so we found a way to um, create a conversation around a national issue, create dialogue, but then also bring local stations into the fold and go out and co-create and co-produce at the local level. Um, those, that content ended up um, going on to pbs.org and right around Memorial Day, um, two videos per week were released and it will continue through I think next week or the week after, but it was a little bit of a different model. So it was not a television uh, piece, property, but there may be some opportunity in the future. I think the producers are talking to the folks at World Channel, Chris Hastings. Um, just I'll do a name drop in case you guys don't know Chris. He's a wonderful person to know. He's the executive producer at World Channel. He's out at Nadleep, the Nadleep Media Summit um, this week. But that was just an example of something that Starting off, it may not, you know, be television, but it's it's a, it's another platform. It's another way to tell stories and build community dialogue around an, an important issue, and from that we can sort of build, and it, it can be additive, and we can think about future opportunities. So, a few different ways to approach it. So, building off of that, I want to tee up something that I think um, kind of drill down into the the diversity piece. Um, with a project that sounds similar, where you, where CAM and KQED um, work together with Grace Lee, independent filmmaker, mm -hmm. um, on a project called Off the Menu. Yes. So, so I'll just give a couple of lines about Off the Menu. It aired on PBS, I think at the end of last year. Um, CAM, the Center for Asian American Media, um, co-produced this series with Grace Lee and KQED. Um, it aired on PBS, but it also had an amazing uh, showing online. I've just got some quick statistics. Um, it got over 1,200 likes on Facebook. Over 250 people were reached from Facebook posts. Um, there were recipe contests. And really, the series is it's sort of a road trip into um, different places around the country that give viewers a highlight into relationship and how our relationship with food really affects 
reflects an evolving um, culture and, um, and around the country. So um, they had more than 8,000 streams on PBS.org, more than 8,000 page views on PBS's food page. So it really ended up being sort of a really nice collaboration. So this is a really short clip that we thought we could, could show you guys just so that you can get a little bit of a feel of the content. They say you are what you eat. If so, then I'm actually a mixture of Korean, Salvadoran, Armenian, and Thai. A reflection of all the people who feed me where I live in Los Angeles. I can't speak for every Asian with a camera, but I think my fascination with food is a way to understand community, family, and personal history. Maybe food can even help us grasp something as vast and complex as Asian America. But to do that, we'll have to go off the menu. It's sort of authenticity of spirit. So the food is not authentically any region. I mean, frankly, it's probably not authentically Chinese. I mean, it's, it's Chinese American food. But the spirit of it, I feel like there is something very Chinese about it. All right, we can fry them. <laughs> the food, it sounds difficult, but it actually, in palate and the flavors, it's not. I feel like, especially amongst Chinese Americans, They'll eat this food, and there's going to be something really familiar about it. What do you think? Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's great. So the voiceover is there's something really familiar about about the food, and then his his family member there says, "What is it?" So that came from the Center for Asian American Media, which is one of several organizations that CPB supports. So in addition to CAM, um, Latino Public Broadcasting um, also provides content and services to public media. Uh, the National Black Programming Consortium, which is based in New York, Vision Maker Media, um, is also another organization, along with PIC, Pacific Islanders in Communication. So these organizations um, really do reflect uh, diversity across the system for public media. So they work a lot with producers to bring stories um, to public media. So I would say if you don't know them, get to know them. They're a great resource, not just on the content side, but these organizations do a lot of work in the professional development space. National Black Programming Consortia, just as an example, launched NBC. The NBPC 360 last year, they're in a round two, where they provide funding for pilots um, on both the digital and television side. So that's been a success. And most of these organizations do have some kind of professional development. So it was great that CAM could actually reach out to KQED. They have a great working relationship. KQED served as their presenting station. So there were probably some resources that KQED could provide in terms of station relations and outreach. So it becomes a little bit of a well-oiled um, machine just in terms of those relationships. So we encourage collaboration, right? We know that that's really important. So we've got to collaborate sort of at the system level, the work that we do with PBS and other organizations. But we really do encourage producers and organizations to find those opportunities to collaborate with the system. So I think Off the Menu um, was just a great example of not just um, on TV side, but also in the digital space. And a lot of the response that they were able to get by working with the folks on the PBS.org team to really design some very cool and creative concepts for the web space. So that's how that kind of came together in terms of funding. Um, it was through our diversity and innovation fund. We do have a DNI fund at CPB that we support um, limited specials and series and a lot of other things. Um, so there are some pots of money within CPB um, that are, that are available. Of gold. The hidden pots of gold. <laughs> I wouldn't say gold. <laughs> tiny, tiny gold. <laughs> tiny gold nuggets. Tiny gold so nuggets. <laughs> um, okay, so do you want to um, speak a little bit about, I, I want to get at this 
space of figuring out how to talk about the intersection between, because we're mostly talking with independent filmmakers. So I, I want to offer up opportunities to, to be discussing other stuff too, um, of sort of how you can work with independent filmmakers um, and support them when they're uh, you know, broadcasting the work on, on, on public television. Um, can, I, uh, can I just ask a little bit about the, the support work that, or uh, the, the strategy that PBS developed in partnership with Stanley Nelson and um, Black Panthers? Um, and, and I want to stay there. I know you have some content that you want to show of some other stuff, but I, I think the Black Panthers um, documentary is probably something that people are really highly familiar with here, and they would, you know, it, it was such a smashing success. I think people would want to know how PBS was a partner in that. Um, and frankly, I want to know, because <laughs> I thought it was pretty amazing. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you about Panthers. Maybe just before we get too far, and, and, and I think there's a little bit of a tie-in, I brought just kind of a, a very short um, genre reel from our history, yes, our history that. shows. And uh, in, even though, uh, obviously, um, Stanley's film was an independent film that, uh, that aired within Independent Lens, it, it certainly speaks to history. And I think history is a space where we've really been um, making some, some real inroads uh, in bringing diverse content. So we'll Fantastic. share that briefly and then. Great. I'm always searching to feel like I fit into something. We are the people that we are because of our past. It's complicated. I'm just one of many who stop being silent. It's just proof of how far we have come. Make sure in all the hustle and bustle, we don't lose sight of why we're here. It all boils down to communicating the lives we live. If you look closely, they've got a story to tell. It connects with you in a very deep way. We wish you love, peace, and so Come with us on this great adventure. The reason why I love that um, that genre reel is because I think it really gets at something that we've been r striving toward, which is you know expanding that notion of who we are mm -hmm. as Americans, who we are uh, as a as a broader community, and finding the, the the content and the makers who really support that vision. And so certainly, when the opportunity came uh, to work in partnership with CPB and uh, Independent Lens and others to uh, to bring Stanley's um, Black Panthers to public broadcasting, we thought it was hugely important. Um, that piece of work stands as a part of a trilogy of films that Stanley is working on for us, uh, which will include um, uh, uh, Tell Them We Are Rising, the, the story of HBCUs. Uh, and then, of course, he's got a, a fantastic film also coming to us on the African slave trade. Uh, I think that this was a fantastic partnership because in go going at that project in force, we were really able to give it a complete surround. Um, it's one of a handful of films that PBS has been able to handle everything from the theatrical release all the way through broadcast um, and all of the, the intricate um, um, pieces in between, especially on the engagement side. Um, I think that Stanley's team at Firelight, and um, including uh, Sonia Childress, who was uh, an amazing engagement producer who worked as a part of that campaign, um, Amy Letourneau, who uh, is the person at PBS Distribution, which is our sister company that handles um, both uh, domestic and international distribution for certain projects, and is also our partner on the theatrical distribution for these projects. All of these folks really came together um, to come up with a very coordinated campaign so that there was real intentionality. We knew that we wanted the film to premiere at Sundance, and fortunately, um, that came to pass. And then from the time of Sundance, we, we strategically got together and said, how are we going to sequence this? When are we going to handle the theatrical release? How are we going to handle um, the event strategy with stations so that um, they both feel supported even during the theatrical release time and really see this as an opportunity where they're going to begin that, um, that important word of mouth campaign that ultimately is going to pay off when it does come to broadcast. 
Uh, how are we going to build the social media strategy? Because for a film like this, this is going to be incredibly important. Um, and so uh, I think it was a fine example for us of what happens when you bring that team together and you work in that type of coordinated fashion. And ultimately, the results, um, you know, um, tell the story uh, theatrically. It's a film that for us made you know, over half a million dollars at the box office. Uh, it's a film that we thought we were going to take to you know, perhaps eight, ten cities. Ultimately, it had more than 150 different screenings around the country. Um, so that part of the campaign was fantastic. And then in terms of the on-air execution, it's the highest rated independent lens film that we've ever had. Uh, it was the most social film in PBS history. Uh, literally, uh, we broke the internet that night. Um, but 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 it takes but it takes that type of um, clear uh, dedication and focus and in, in, in real direction and partnership. Uh, and so we're we're eager and looking for more opportunities to do that type of thing. And and I would just add um, from. The perspective of Firelight, the fact that they do films, but we also know there's the Firelight Director's Lab. And so um, that is work that is helping to bring even more filmmakers um, into the fold, into the conversation, bringing their films onto a national platform. And so it's it's critical because, you know, I think the most successful models are when we can help bring each other along mm -hmm. and share information and share contacts even, right? Share resources. So if it means taking a little bit of time out of our schedules to make connections, I think that that's really critical going back to Marie's point about networking and, and building up strong networks. And so, again, kudos to Stanley and Firelight and Marsha Smith and uh, Laura Limble, who does a fantastic job. They all do a fantastic job with the Firelight Documentary Lab and helping to um, bring more filmmakers along. If I Can I share one funny little anecdote? Yeah. I was at a conference, and I attended a dinner, and it just so happened that the person I was seated next to was MC Hammer. <laughs> Um, of course. <laughs> uh, so that was already blowing my mind, right? And so we were having a conversation, and he says to me, uh, this was the night after Panthers premiered on air on PBS. And he said, oh, you guys had a big night last night. And so I, I was joking around. I said, oh, is the word on the street? You know? And he's like, I am the street. I, I, I was live tweeting throughout the whole film. And so I, I was like, oh, that's fantastic. He's like, yeah. And, you know, and I told Jack that he needed to retweet all of my tweets. And so I was like, who's Jack? He's like, Jack Dorsey, the head of Twitter. <laughs> sure enough, I go back to, I like, I immediately like, you know, I'm like, wait a minute. So I, sh I shoot off an email to, you know, our social media team asking them to, to pull some, some data. Uh, he was the number three most important um, um, person tweeting during that entire campaign. MC he has Hammer. more than three million Twitter followers. It's crazy. Uh, and it was just, it was, it was mind blowing to just, to number one, to see that, and then number two, to know that we were reaching MC Hammer with this content and that he was a part of our, he was our like secret weapon. That's so crazy. I love it. That's so, I love it. So really, that is so wild. Really I don't do. even know where to go with yeah. that. No, um, uh, so we, so you kind of pivoted into a space that I wanted to talk about a little bit before we open up to to the audience, and that's the professional development piece. You know, so we've talked a, a, a quite a bit here about <clears throat> the content and engagement and working. You know, figuring out how to pair producers with other parts of the system. You know, how you bring the system together to support an independent filmmaker. Um, you know, whether they're you know, producing a series in, in, in co-production with a station or they produce something that, you know, gets picked up by one of the strands, you know, POV or independent lens. Um, and that's huge and that's important. But the professional development piece, I think, is also really mm -hmm. critical. And Firelight is, is Firelight uh, Producers Lab is one really important um, organization that's supporting filmmakers. But I wonder if you want to, if either one of you want to talk a little bit more about next generation leadership and, um, and that programming. Carlos did talk about it a bit, 
Um, but he did it mostly in a breakout session. And so I think that for the broader community, the broader audience, it might be helpful to hear more about that program and, and sure. how you've conceived it, to pull, you know, what's going on with it, how it works. Sure. So I'll just um, talk a little bit sort of at a high level um, that I think there's always a vision um, within an organization like CPB that there's always more work that we can do around professional development from everything from content creators um, in front of the camera, behind the camera, and I'm talking about key editorial roles, and not someone that you bring in from a diverse background who's just with a part of the project. You want them there from day one until the end, right? So from CPB's standpoint, we're looking at professional development from a system-wide standpoint. We know that our future leadership leaders of tomorrow that the faces are changing quite a bit, so we want to figure out ways that we can help to support that, but also at the producer and content creator level. So there was a vision to create a program, um, a little bit of a mentoring, but also an executive um, professional leadership program where it, there could be some real thought behind developing a curriculum, right? So WGBH, um, uh, brought an idea to us, it was through um, an RFP process, um, that they would work with a company out of Boston called The Partnership, Carol Folk. So they really sort of came in with this idea to not just um, find those emerging uh, leaders who, who really are on the cusp of becoming executive producers, programming leaders within the system, um, that came from different backgrounds. So it was really about finding a model and a method that could really work and also engage stations. So there um, are eight executive fellows. It's a year-long program and it's really designed to give them not just a professional leadership experience, but also give them access to key leaders within the system. So they have met, engaged, talked to, gotten to know the folks at PBS, the folks at major producing stations, the folks at ITVS, the folks at POV. Um, so it's really been a great experience in, in terms of giving them the, those hands-on um, experiences that can make them better future leaders. But then the question is, is also around how do we sustain that program? So we can fund it or support it for a year, but part of my job is to think about how we sustain that program for the future. So it's very easy to say, okay, we've got this big idea, but you need resources in order to do this. And these are not small amount of, of of monies that need to go towards these programs because they involve developing a curriculum, they involve travel, they involve people's time and, and focus and attention. So really the goal is for us to think about creating a cohort and future cohorts of programming leaders so we know across the system that our executive producers, even at the producing stations, we, we don't have a big diverse group there. So we want to change that. And we know that 20 years down the road, in order for public media to be vibrant and to be doing a lot more, we have to figure out ways to get people the training, the experience, the mentorship that they, they will really need and to think about succession and, and what does the future um, look like for public media. And you can't do it if you don't have the right people, but you have to invest in the people um, which is why you know we need to think about what happens beyond this first year of next generation leadership. So I want to see it go on and on and on. So we're having some conversations now about how to do that. So more to come. But in addition to next generation leadership, like I said, um, a lot of the national minority consortia organizations do a lot of professional development. Um, we've also got, of course, the Firelight Directors Lab. So there are opportunities, um, and of course, I think this, what we're doing now is so valuable because we're an intimate group. You can have that face-to-face -face conversation, get to know people, exchange cards, but then also follow up. So when I give you my card, I'll say, okay, yeah, give me a call or email, but I really do mean it. You know, it may not be something that we could work on right now, but at least I know it's in my brain that I've met you. And if there's something in the future that's happening, we stay in touch and we build connection that way. Can I, if I could just add that, I mean, I think that next generation leadership has been incredibly important, and I think it's important, especially within public media organizations around the country, because it gave, in this first round, an opportunity for folks who are already currently in the system, right? 
um, who are in maybe in that mid-tier level position, but looking to kind of um, break out of that a little bit. So I think that that was an important step. It also kind of loops back to what we were talking about at the beginning in terms of just expanding the network, making it such that when there are decisions being made, you know, the same conversation about, well, I just don't know any diverse candidates who might be ready for that type of leadership opportunity. That's a conversation that can't be had, mm -hmm, um, which right. is super mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. I will put my little bug in uh, Sylvia's ear uh -huh. for this next round of conversation because for me, the I think the, the, the other piece of this uh, on the other side of it, though, is figuring out how we still do expand opportunity because the one thing I do worry about is that we're going to have people who have these expanded networks and more uh, access to training and all of these different things, but if there's no place for them to grow within the system, then in that way, I don't want to see those folks necessarily having to exit public right. broadcasting. Or leave public media. Yeah, we For don't sure. want that. Maybe a complementary piece to this is some of the work that we've been able to do with some of the other CPB funded initiatives, including a program that's coming to us from WNET called The Talk. Um, which I think is going to be a fantastic film. Uh, it was really, in some ways, springboarded around a lot of conversations that were happening around the country in the aftermath of Ferguson and all of the other incidents um, about the importance of uh, this conversation that's happening within diverse communities about how to keep their children and, in particular, you know, their sons safe. Um, you know, as they you know confront these issues of uh, of local policing. Uh, and so we're working with WNET. WNET has brought on Sam Pollard to executive produce that project. But the fantastic thing ultimately is that this is going to be, he's working in partnership with a number of diverse filmmakers who are all out um, canvassing and, 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 and producing uh, segments within that film. So. Can we, do we have time to share a little clip from the talk? Or? I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Go and ahead. as he cues that up, I would just say an, an, an important piece to that is also the community engagement. So we know that these conversations don't, shouldn't, won't, they won't, they don't happen in a vacuum. So it's moved beyond conversations that when I was growing up, it was all sort of around the table and our parents talked to us about as young ladies, my sister and me, you know, here's what you need to know. But we know those conversations have moved beyond um, the kitchen or dining room table. So they need to be out in the community. Mm -hmm. So what's important for CPB um, is to support those efforts at stations. And we're not saying that we have solutions. We know that communities adapt solutions to their needs. And we don't want to be a flyover. We're coming in just for this. But we want to create a system, a mechanism by which when something like this does happen, and unfortunately it may happen again coming out of some of the more recent incidents, that stations can have the resources that they need in order to have these conversations. So that's what makes it um, pretty exciting and unique. And I will also say that WNET is working with each of the minority consortia organizations to hopefully create some digital shorts. Um, they're having some conversation with some other platform entities, but we think it's a way to really expand it. Mm -hmm. um, in addition mm -hmm. to the film, there'll be some other opportunities to, to make it a, a bigger conversation, and, and really that's the goal. So more to come, so I think we're ready for the clip. Okay. There is growing outrage tonight after an unarmed African-American teenager was shot and killed by police. Damn. Details about the fatal shooting in South Carolina called Kim. This is the reality that we live with every single day of our lives, that our sons can be stopped by the police and don't come back home. Right over here in this general location is where my brother got killed. As I think about my own sons, the time is going to come where I have to have the talk with them. This thing that we call the talk, I look at it as being something that really is a readiness conversation. It is a preparatory conversation. It is a survival conversation. It had to be about 3.30, and I was getting ready to um, cook dinner for the children. Two little boys knocked on my door and said that uh, my son had been shot by the police. Responding to a report of someone with a gun, Officer Loman shot and killed Tamir just seconds after arriving on the scene. We've grown to a point now where our young black boys, our young brown boys are criminalized. 
People always perceive that somebody that is a gang member or up to no good. The talk is meant to prepare you for the possibility that there is a danger and you may have an opportunity to save your own life. What you do, how you interact, what you say if you're stopped while you're walking. You have to be respectful, even if you know you're right and they're wrong. You keep your hands at 10 and 2 and you don't reach for anything because I want you to live. No matter what level of education or accomplishment, African Americans and people of color are subject to this. There will be for generations to come the need to have the talk. And I would add, I think it's important to say that, um, that the film will include a number of different perspectives. So it's not, you know, just a conversation um, about police incidents, um, that there will also be voices from the police that you'll hear about um, in terms of it being sort of a true dialogue and hearing a, a lot of different perspectives because we know that it's not just sort of a a one-way conversation that it really should be a, a dialogue across across the table. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty heavy stuff. And and amazing that it can happen at public broadcasting. Like this is the place for it. Um, I want to. We're we're just about out of time. Um, so I want to open up the space for people to ask uh, a question or two. How does public broadcasting see innovation in the film space, and what are you looking for um, from filmmakers to innovate into the future, as TV and stations are kind of being disrupted? There's a lot of different ways in which we're looking at innovation. I think that if you look at some of the, the films that are coming to us in the, in the next season of Independent Lens, for example, you've got an amazing film uh, called Tower, which uh, I hope some of you may have seen since it's premiered at South by Southwest, which looks at the first mass shooting incident in the United States at the University of Texas, Austin, and uh, has a very beautiful and, and, and advanced and, um, uh, and perfectly executed use of animation in the storytelling. So I think it's everything from the approach to the storytelling to, uh, you know, clearly we've been working um, quite a bit with Frontline and with the other series to expand our, our understanding and our offerings in, in terms of virtual reality. Uh, so we really are looking for um, uh, filmmakers to be in the vanguard when it comes to this. And I think some of our uh, recent uh, exposure to, uh, to what's happening in the VR field, just uh, at some of the film f festivals internationally, uh, I think that there's uh, real room for us to grow. And then I think the, the other piece of this is figuring out how we continue to knit together all of the platforms. So continuing to push innovation and making sure that for every single one of these platforms that we're developing native content that really speaks to those audiences and that it's not just you know, uh, the cut and paste approach of, you know, developing your film and then grabbing a clip here and a clip there, but really thinking about every single one of those platform audiences and building on that. Uh, and so in, in that way, we've been working very closely with um, the social media team that we have at PBS and at the series, um, the engagement teams uh, as well, uh, to keep pushing uh, uh, innovation in all of those spaces. And I would just add, um, to that I think um, sort of breeding a culture of innovation, em embracing it, rewarding it, um, are all just really great things to think about. And I think for CPB, um, we're now in a space where we're thinking about that as well. So we've got some funds um, for digital projects. And I have to say, I've probably seen more um, sort of VR-related things come through over the last few months. Um, I think another way to get towards that thinking about innovation. Innovation could be as simple as how we bring in new audiences. So there have been a couple of projects that have a research component to it. So for example, um, there's a project out of WGBH called Latin Music USA um, that sort of came back and will be a rebroadcast on PBS. But this time around, since the program's original premiere, we're now talking a lot more about how we're engaging off air. And so there's a research component. So there's a, a, a multicultural agency called Census um, that will be doing some research that will tell us more specifically about how millennials and younger people are coming into that content space. So for us, it really, I think, represents some inroads into understanding where we need to be. 
um, in terms of innovation and platforms and new ways of how we're engaging with audiences. So I think for CPB, it's pretty exciting in that we can um, really also help stations with their capacity in terms of innovation. So giving them um, not just the resources that they need for thinking about content, but the Im infrastructure. So, you know, we're talking about a lot of stations that may not have the infrastructure to even think about being, quote, mm -hmm. innovative. We just need to keep the lights on. So mm -hmm. what are some ways that, from CPB standpoint, that we could pro provide some support in that um, area too? So um, lots of good stuff happening. I heard someone say the other day that like shorts are the new feature. Have you been finding a new audience? Is it different from the broadcast audience? And has, has there been a lot of success so far with putting out digital short form content? I would say that there's been real clear success. Uh, if you spend any time at all um, with Frontline just in terms of their, their, their digital work, uh, it's phenomenal because what they've done um, that in some ways has broken the mold for, for many of our teams is they don't fire up digital on the back end. They actually fire up digital simultaneously when they commission um, when they commission their films. So in the process and in the lead up to the frontline films actually making it to air, they have an entire digital team, um, including um, um, video producers, digital video producers who are creating short films and developing reporting as they are building the, um, uh, the plane. So they're, they're flying the, the plane while they're building it. Hmm. And so I think those are the types of examples that we certainly point to as, as, as ways that we're, we're demonstrating leadership. In terms of PBS.org, uh, we're now um, approaching the, the fourth year of the online shorts film festival, which is something that they've done every summer um, in recent years as a way of being able to spur some growth in this area, understanding that shorts are so important um, on a digital platform and working with a, a whole host of member stations and producing partners to try and, and get the submissions in. And they've seen a, a incredible growth in the audience for those shorts. And I will say to you that we are also exploring the opportunity for us to do broader partnerships with other media organizations that would allow us to be able to increase the volume of shorts that we would be able to bring to our audiences. So it's definitely something that we have a strong interest in, and it's definitely something that we're, we're making a concerted effort um, to build around. Fantastic. Um, are there other questions in the audience? I would just add that I think the station community does, you know, they do a lot of really incredible, innovative things in the cut. You don't hear about it oftentimes, right. but there's a lot going on. You know, in the years that I spent yeah. working um, with the system, um, there was wonderful stuff out of KQD always. I mean, I think it's just in the, you know, the water there in San Francisco. They just mm -hmm. innovate things. The right. tech film thing just explodes and they create dope stuff. Um, but Austin PBS also, I think, has done a, a lot of really interesting stuff. So there, there are stations around the system that I think um, are, are in the space of innovating, and, and certainly POV mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, with the digital work they've been doing and the support that they've they've provided to to all sorts of, of um, with their their hacks, I think, have been amazing. So I, I think there's so much here, and I kind of said that yesterday, like I feel like Sometimes when you're on the inside, you're privy to what's happening, and you're so excited about everything. And and from the outside, it's it's hard to know all the incredible stuff that you all are doing. I was going to say thank you for mentioning POV, and just a shout out to Adnan and that whole side of the team who are doing phenomenal Amazing work in that work. space. Yeah. And you also mentioned Austin. One of the exciting things uh, and partnerships that we have with KLRU. Uh, is that we are about to launch this summer uh, a, a nine film series called Postcards from the Great Divide, which was an effort for us to find um, an opportunity to do some short form um, uh, documentary filmmaking around the issues of the election. Uh, so they've commissioned nine films from a, a very uh, diverse group of filmmakers around the country. And it's also a, an attempt to bring the, the the, the stories of the election down to the regional level and, and, and much more at a, a grassroots level. And yeah, so we're excited about great. that. And also KLRU does a lot in the American graduate space. So they um, launched um, Eastside Education uh, and actually Sarah Robertson, who's their head of 
production is out at Nalip um, presenting on a panel um, talking about Veterans Coming Home and American Graduate and some of these other initiatives that we talk about, but they're doing work right there in their community, and that was a series of digital shorts um, that were really good and very well received in their community. So we're here, they're there, and you know, we, we, we really want to make it an experience where we can learn and grow and, and share among, among each other. So thank you yes. to Jennifer thank MacArthur. You. You she awesome. is like thank you. planner, organizer, moderator. Um, just, the list just goes on and on. Thank, thank, you. thank you so thank much. Thank you, this is fantastic, thank you.